uh, experience in the CPC I, which is the CPC Classic. Um, as everyone knows, there were seven regions involved in the uh, project that uh, ran from 2012 to 2016. Um, all those regions are involved in the CPC Plus, as well as an additional uh, seven regions for the round one, uh, which has just finished its first year. Round two has just joined us, as I said, kicking off 2018 with a bang. Really glad to have all of you with us. Um, so what we're going to be doing is um, really kind of an informal discussion, and I'm going to start out sort of by calling on just have uh, folks start out describing uh, what they felt their experience was with shared savings, specifically looking at the 2015 and 2016. You all should have gotten a copy of that uh, in your uh, email along with the invitation to this. Um, if you don't have it, um, send me a quick uh, chat message and I'll make sure that you get one um, by the um, I'm doing this uh, webinar so you have a chance to look at it. Um, so what I'd like to do, we're, we're hoping to have uh, David Kendrick uh, join us uh, initially because of the work that was going on in Oklahoma. He's in the process of traveling right now, so he'll uh, dial in when he's able to. So what I was going to do was at least um, turn to our colleagues in Arkansas um, who had uh, some analogous experience in terms of the shared savings that were observed in 2015 and 16, um, not as... as um, as uh, large a, a change as was seen in Oklahoma, but nonetheless um, important. And uh, if I can just turn to Alicia and Missy um, initially, just to uh, have a little bit of input from you and then from uh, Anne and, and Bill uh, from Arkansas Medicaid. Hi, Lisa, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you just great, thank you. Um, we're, we're very excited as the state of Arkansas uh, Arkansas Blue Cross and Blue Shield for both um, the final year, both for 15 and 16, to distribute time savings to our CPC Classic practices. Um, I will, if you have not had the opportunity, I will tell you it's one of the funnest things you get to do, send out payments. Um, so I think one of the things that we saw that the big wins in Arkansas is really um, early on with that opportunity, I think it was very important where we brought with the practices that ability to really risk identify the risk scores and to really integrate the risk of the patient into their electronic medical records to kind of work through workflows in the practices to integrate that risk factor and the risk scoring of a patient throughout the, the entire clinic and one of the examples i'll give you is that um, one of the clinics that we worked with that actually put it into their EMR and even to the fact of the receptionist when scheduling patients implemented or made, you know, changes on that, that schedule needed based upon some risk scoring and really making that throughout the practices. So I think that was something that um, early on we started seeing, but really typically both in our pilot and in CPC, you don't really see that shared savings until around year three or four. And that's exactly what we saw in our pilot and as well as in CPC. I think um, within Arkansas, we had 54 of 57 practices that met the quality requirements and were eligible to receive the savings in our region. And um, with CMS's perspective and also, like I said, coordinating and delivering that. So we had just a little over a million with CMS and um, you know, that, that was an average of our practices of just under $20,000 per practice that they received. And that's really, I mean, that was a huge impact for those practices and the work that they were doing. You know, from, uh, you know, 15 and 16 Blue Cross and CMS, we, we both were able to carry those checks out and support the practices. And I think probably the first couple of years, the practice's question is, is it really ever going to happen in shared saving? And so it was a great opportunity. From an Arkansas Blue Cross and Blue Shield standpoint, we did something a little bit different around the shared savings. Um, some of you may have the similar experience, but when a physician is, is employed by a system, early in our program, we heard, well, they're not sharing the money with me and I'm doing the work. So we we started in 15 and did the same for this last um, distribution that we, before we send any money out for shared savings, 
we send out a thank you letter to the physicians, in, um, individual physicians, regardless if they're self-employed or if they're employed by a system. And we sent them the amount of savings and a thank you for their hard work in this program. Um, it went over, um, you know, from the first year we got a couple calls from systems. This past year we I have not received any calls. But what we included this past year as well, we really wanted them to see the value of this program and their hard work. With the so we included not only. this time around their name as well that they had received for the year and sent that in the letter as well so um, you know I think between the risk and then the other thing the Arkansas practices did incredibly well was care coordination using those care management fees to hire care coordinators and to really coordinate the practices and put those resources to those highest risk patients that was also a big win for our state of grief. So that's a few highlights, Lisa. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or if you want to pass it on to Ann. Alicia, thank you very much for that. Um, I guess I'd like to open it up for uh, quick questions and then we'll uh, move on to Ann and, and Dr. Golden. Just check on the chat function. Lisa? Yes. Uh, this is Eric Muther from the uh, greater Philadelphia region. Um, hi, hi, how are you? Quick question, just, um, and it may have just been my connection, but uh, the end part of uh, what Alicia said about the, what they did at the in the end got a little bit cut off. I know she was describing that she would send notices out to individual physicians to show their savings, et cetera, but just wondering if she could recap what, what was done in the end. There. Sure, thank you. Yeah, it was a little fuzzy for me too. I'm sorry, Alicia, just the very last bit, as you said, the, the what you really wanted to turn over to the practices in terms of really making them feel that they were seeing the fruits of their labor. Yes, absolutely. So we, we in the first year, just sent out their shared savings summary. But for 2017, what we did is we included a total payment of care coordination fees in addition to their shared savings and their thank you notice to them to kind of share that information. We didn't, this didn't get the same pushback the second year and we really got a lot of good feedback from the, the physicians um, that they appreciated that and, and it, it's important to have that type of support into these programs and for them to see that information. We also did um, substantial um, several press releases um, via the web and the, the um, newspaper and other avenues trying to really uh, help everyone throughout the state understand how important this work is and the great job that our practices are doing. Thank you. That's great. Um, so, Missy, nothing from, from you where Alicia is speaking for the, the Blues in um, Arkansas? Yep, she's speaking for both of us today, okay, Lisa. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, Anne and Dr. Golden, can I uh, turn to you perhaps for your observations of uh, what you what you think happened in Arkansas in those two years? Sure, um, I, and I think Dr. Golden and I are on the same page on this, but I also think we had a lot of support for our practices, you know, whether it be via practice transformation coaches going out there and assisting them with implementing processes and efficiency um, measures within their practice. I think that helped out a lot. Um, we're also very collaborative between the multi-payers. You know, we sit down, we get together, we try to, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> we try to align all our efforts uh, to make sure we're all moving along towards the same goal. I think that, that reduces the burden on the practices and, um, it, and it helps them achieve that same common goal that we all have. Um, Dr. Golden, do you have something more to add? Yeah, I just was gonna say, you know, you compare us to Oklahoma, you know, we were statewide, so we were in a lot of very rural areas, and <coughs> Oklahoma got great results, but was mostly in, I think, the Tulsa area, more urban, so a smaller geographic region. So, you know, that gave us a couple of different kind of challenges, but also underscores the, um, the uh, strength of the outcomes we received. But as Ann said, I think that one of the things that we have done is that you know we required uh, 
that every practice achieves certain practice transformation uh, uh, points. But well, we actually sent people out in the field to actually inspect and to validate the attestations of what they said they were doing. And they uh, therefore got direct feedback. So it was the trust but verify approach. And I think that the verification process, I think, sped along the transformation and set in place the infrastructure that resulted in some really good positive outcomes. Yeah, we kind of got them from both ends. You know, we we do the upfront education, and then we'd have a separate team go out and actually validate to make sure they actually implemented these efforts. I think doing from getting doing both sides, it really it helped out the practices really transform into a more efficient way of providing care. So, Anne and and Dr. Golden, can I? This is Lisa. I just want to ask a clarifying question. How um, at, what was sort of the time interval of going out and validating that you felt like the sort of education was uh, sticking, shall we say, and, and did you how many times in the course of a year and um, or if you did it more than once? Uh, we do it at six months, uh, 12 months, and then um, for, we also did some at 18 months after the performance year started. So there's different validations for different times of the year, um, depending on what. Yeah, on the, on the ramp up, um, the, when you were a new PCMH, there's a glide path to, uh, we, we gave people, you know, a, a stratified um, expectations of how they were going to become um, an acceptable PCMH. And now that the program is more mature, uh, probably a lot of these things are now only going to be checked once a year. But, um, you know, things like care plans became real difficult for practices. But we did things like call practices up to make sure they had live voice access at night or we also went in and made sure that they had instructions for patients about how to access the practice after hours. So in many ways, um, as the program matures, the need for uh, regular um, uh, um, visits uh, goes down because you begin, they have already achieved a certain level of competency. Great, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions for um, Ann Sandifer or uh, Dr. Uh, William Golden? specifically right now? <coughs> okay, great. Um, so if I just want to uh, just put out a question, is um, uh, Dr. David Kendrick on, yeah. the, on the line right now? Sounds like no, okay. Um, but uh, Peter, Peter Aaron is on in Melody from Oklahoma. Um, could I prevail upon uh, one of you to just uh, share your observations? in terms of the um, shared savings that were seen for Oklahoma in those two years? Sure, I'd be glad to. And uh, Alicia and the folks in Arkansas have said much of what we've experienced. But even though you're, even though one of the speakers mentioned that this is a, a shared savings, much of, much of it coming out of Tulsa, I would really typify this as more of a, a rural, small town community approach. Uh, we have three health systems in Tulsa, but we had 55 practices from around Northeast Oklahoma. So think of it as a rural state initiative. It would be different from our speaker on the phone, participant on the phone from Philadelphia, for example. The bottom line is, and there's no one secret sauce about why we may have done well, but I think one of the things in that secret sauce, one of the parts of the recipe, is that we had we did exactly what I bet CMS wanted us to do as payers. Uh, I'm with a payer organization and we really did have a multi-payer collaborative to the point that at our face-to-face -face meetings, <clears throat> people didn't know who was United, who was Community Care, who was Blue Cross. They all thought that we were members of a CMS team uh, leading the whole discussion or kind of coordinating, enabling the discussion. And only later, or when people knew us socially, would they know that we were um, maybe working with Blue Cross or some other payer organization. So I have to give kudos to CMS for coming up with a multi-payer idea. I have to give kudos to the payers that were willing to be part of this, throw their hats in the ring. Um, I might add one thing. You, Dr. Kendrick's going to come online in a minute. In our particular 
area in northeast Oklahoma. Another ingredient in our secret sauce, there's really no secret sauce, but another ingredient in that metaphorical secret sauce is he started out a program that some of you may be familiar with from the Beacon Communities Grant. Uh, and now Dr. Kendrick uh, has spoken to a lot of us on this call about My Health, which is the HIE that he leads up. He and Dr. Dan Duffy were really spearheaded this community involvement in Tulsa. So Tulsa is like a lot of communities uh, where we have health systems, I mentioned three, that are really antagonistic towards each other, or really competitive maybe, and market share is a big deal. So I was surprised uh, eight or nine years ago when Kendrick and Duffy were able to mobilize our health systems. I was CMO of one of those at that time, and the docs don't feel the competition in the city or in the area, but the, the C-suite people do. And they were able to mobilize us as a community to, be, to, to send in a grant for the Beacons Grant, and we won that, thank goodness. And then after the Beacon Community Grant, uh, we participated in CPCI, like most people on the call, and now CPC Plus. But a point I want to make is that once you start doing this as a community, and we have to focus on CPC Plus right now, I understand that, but another part of this is same prototypes or model based on patient-centered medical home that make CPCI and CPC Plus work, the risk stratification, the care management, the information technology, the bringing the patients and the families into our planning process. All those things uh, we need to extrapolate out to our subspecialists. At a CMS meeting maybe a year ago, I mentioned to, to somebody who's now, I think, in Blue Cross, South Carolina, Patrick, I said, you know, it's interesting, we have the primary care initiative, and we have ACO initiative, but we don't have anything in the middle, really. Well, we did. We had an oncology care model that we're participating in. So one thing I want to put in the middle of everybody's mind, as we're working on CPC+, Plus, be thinking of how to engage other subspecialists, whether they're oncologists or cardiologists or gastroenterologists or neurologists or orthopedic surgeons in our initiative. Uh, we've tried to do that. It's fortunate to be part of OCM, and, and that helps make each individual stronger. So those are comments I'd like to make. Great. Thank you, Peter. Really appreciate your um, sharing those. Um, Melody, I, I know you're uh, with the Oklahoma Care, Health Care Authority, which is the um, Sooner Care and the Medicaid program that's uh, based in the state. I don't know if you wanted to just share any quick observations from your perspective. Uh, just one. I'd like to, you know, piggyback off of what Arkansas and Peter have been saying that having people available to go into the practice and support those uh, care managers and the practice team as they transform is one of the things that I believe added a lot of value to our participation in Classic and is transforming into PLUS. Uh, there's a lot of stress at the practice level when they start a new initiative, that's especially when it's multi-payer. And there's a lot of requirements that the practice is not familiar with. And so I think one of the main things that any payer uh, moving forward <clears throat> would be uh, to have that support from the payers that go in the practices, regardless of whether they're contracted with the payer or not. They, they don't walk in as a Blue Cross Blue Shield representative or as a Sooner Care Medicaid representative. They walk in as a CPC representative and are totally focused on the needs of that individual practice. Melody, can you um, maybe just uh, for the group just describe a little bit about the field services team, which is really where that work um, has been centered? Uh, well, basically, when Classic began, um, the, the payers got together and the first thing they realized that we needed to do in order to support the practices was to have individuals from each payer group form a field service team that worked in conjunction with the contracted uh, facilitators that CMS had in Oklahoma 
there were two of those and there were a lot more practices to support than two people could handle. So they developed a charter, they developed a process on um, <clears throat> how to communicate with the practices, they risk stratified the practices, worked on the ones that were high risk uh, first, and um, if one of the field service representatives walked in and the practice had a need that they were not familiar with, they had someone on the field service team that they could refer that practice to. So, and then they met uh, weekly to talk about challenges and ways to improve their impact at the practice level. So the, the uh, cost of having the field services team was borne collectively by the payers who were participating? Is that correct? Yes, yes. And they were actually able to, when, they, when my health would give the practices some analytics, um, they would be able to communicate the needs back to my health on uh, some some improvements into the analytics that the practices were receiving. They were never uh, part of the <clears throat> uh, report definitions or actually showing the outcomes of the reports because that was at <coughs> my health level. But they were another way for the practices to communicate back to my health and to the other payers on the needs of those practices. So the communication is going both ways, obviously. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions um, for the Oklahoma team that's on the? Yeah. This is Diana Bianco from Oregon. I had a question about engagement of specialists and how you all um, got specialists to the table and engaged in the conversation. Well, the medical home side, when, when we have in Arkansas, we've always told the practices they had three tasks. One was to manage their own practice and transform their own practice. Uh, two would be to engage their patients. And three would be to uh, manage the medical neighborhood. And suggested to them that the third task was probably the most difficult. And they should start looking at the first two. We are in the process of our episodes of care, uh, developing and using the techniques and the data analysis we've done for that to begin to to create uh, medical neighborhood report cards. And with our new MMIS system, uh, we will be giving the primary care medical homes, the patient centered medical homes, uh, profiles of um, the medical specialist community and how they, uh, their practice variation uh, is or is not a factor in uh, their referrals. But we also had a concomitant activity because we were a CMMI demonstration site for uh, episodes of care. So there has been in our state a lot of conversation about patient journeys and um, uh, global use of resources for selected um, uh, clinical conditions and, and uh, procedures. And this is Thank you. I'll actually add on to that a little bit. I know early on we had many of our medical homes that created the contracts and we really allowed, I mean, supported them with reporting and information as Dr. Golden mentioned, but um, they had contracts that they set up with their specialist and actually did change referral patterns based upon the performance and the compliance with those agreements. And um, it was certainly something they had to continue to address and discuss with the specialist in their area. And, and it's a little bit different from an Arkansas perspective because we do have some smaller rural areas. And so they're probably a little bit closer and, and have that opportunity to have the meetings and the agreements. But um, we did see some improvements in that area. And this is Pete in Oklahoma. There, there's a yin and a yang uh, to a, a topic that we haven't talked about today that I know of that comes up every once in a while. And that is the stressor in the stressors related to some of these initiatives when we're talking about independent physicians versus system owned physicians or system owned practices versus independent practices. One of the, and, and sometimes we talk about the negatives or the liabilities, but there are some strengths. And so I mentioned 
that there were three big systems. So 70%, I think, of our practices were from health systems in the Oklahoma uh, initiative in the Oklahoma region. And of course, they have built-in networks of specialists. Uh, our, our independent docs, and I was an independent doc for a couple decades, um, we tried, but I don't think we were as successful as I wanted us to be when it came to care compacts. I would still urge that type of contracting or care compacts to go on. But I think, but I think what I mentioned a couple minutes ago in my comments maybe is another approach, which is uh, encouraging and engaging the subspecialists to get involved in CMMI projects. And I think we're going to start to see more and more voluntary bundles coming out of CMMI in the next uh, couple of years. I, I worry that there'd be a moratorium from last October, or October of 16 to November of 16, but I think we're going to start seeing more uh, subspecialty bundles. So encouraging your subspecials to get involved in projects that will someday possibly give them accreditation as advanced alternative payment models that Venn diagrams back into CPC Plus, which of course is an advanced alternative payment model. So one thing is, is to stress that. And then on just a small, stupid um, uh, philosophical editorial note, um, when, when I am, in, and I'm an internist, so when I'm interacting with internists and family physicians, um, I tell them I know what the health policy literature talks about when it talks about primary care versus specialists. But I remind them that we all know that they're all specialists. So they're all board certified, residency trained specialists, different from the Marcus Welby GPs of 40 years ago. So um, our, our specialist primary care physicians have constant interactions with subspecialists, of course, in day to day practice. And now we're asking them, so the specialist PCPs, uh, to try and engage at a social level or the medium level, engage the subspecialists in CMMI projects uh, because of MIPS and MACRA and advanced APM. So I think, in a way, all of this is running parallel and will help CPC Plus be stronger in year three, four, and five. Thank you, Peter. Sure. Um, so just before we um, op open it up to uh, ask a few questions of uh, colleagues in other CPC classic regions, so just make sure that uh, David uh, Kendrick was able to dial in. He had some, had just some comments for us. Okay. Um, so when you look at the, uh, this is Lisa again, when you look at the results um, of the uh, 15 and 16 um, uh, shared savings, uh, it, obviously, there's uh, there's some variation that we see, um, and I think that there was uh, understandably some frustration on the parts of some of the regions that felt they were really doing excellent and important work, but um, yep. but found that um, that the results were not um, as expected. Um, and I just I want to open it up to um, our colleagues in the regions that are on the represented on the on the. Uh, phone or on the webinar today, um, just to make a few comments about that. Um, so we have our colleagues, uh, some from Oregon, some from Ohio and, um, and New York today. I want to see if there anybody would like to pass a, a comment along to those of us on the phone. Uh, well, I will start since I, although I was uh, not um, working in any of the particular regions, but um, I did um, have a chance to talk with um, one of our colleagues named uh, Vince Beanberg, who is, um, uh, represents the CDPHP organization, a uh, really uh, wonderful um, player in the Albany region. And uh, he passed on um, a fairly specific um, comment, which I will read to you right now. Um, so specifically that uh, he said that he felt a sticking point was the comparison group that was used for calculating the shared savings. Um, so the region as a whole was uh, disappointed to learn that there would no be would not be any shared savings, uh, given that um, along the CPC classic journey, the region really was performing well on feedback reports. Um, they did feel that perhaps the Achilles heel for them was the 
um, and that continues to be a focal point um, and um, really something that they're uh, focused on at this point, even into the CPC plus. Um, Susan Stewart, are you uh, on the line? I just want to know if, I, if you can tell me if that you think I'm actually uh, stating that correctly. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think Vince makes a very good comment and it's something we discussed a lot in Capitol Hudson in New York, we, you know, with the shared savings results. I, you know, look, I'll be uh, very straightforward. I, I think to this day, Capital, the Capitol Hudson folks don't fully understand why we did really so poorly on on CPC. And I, I think we take it really seriously because everyone's thinking about this as a demonstration program that the Secretary of HHS could expand if it performed well enough, right? Um, you know, so I, there there were a lot of different themes of the discussion about the, the poor performance um, on the Medicare fee-for-service shared savings piece. Um, I think, you know, is there, uh, you know, there's just the real piece of, you know, were the practices not able to do enough for, for whatever reason? And we do think the specialist utilization is a, a big deal in this part of New York and something that we've had our eye on. So I think Vince is right to bring that up. And I think that's uh, a predominant issue. Um, I would also say when I went back and plunged into our Medicare fee-for-service lives in the market, it is complicated by the fact that, you know, in CPCI, you were compared to all of the other Medicare fee-for-service lives in the market, whether they were in Medicare payment arrangements or not. And it appeared to me that a, as much as 40% of uh, the Medicare fee-for-service lives in the market, possibly 50% um, were in Medicare ACOs, uh, generally um, MSSP, one next gen um, in, in the market, and you know, a next gen ACO that vis-a-vis -vis the country, you know, uh, outperformed. So the CPC, mostly independent physicians in the market were being compared, at least half of the comparison group were Medicare ACOs. And we could never unravel, you know, the, the importance of that. But it's something that we were aware of. And, and, and it is what it is. I understand that, you know, Medicare needed to assess the performance of CPCI versus what was otherwise going on in the market. Um, so that's where we ended up. But I, I would say, I don't think we, I don't think we fully understand it. Okay, thank you, Susan. I appreciate your um, uh, candor in um, expressing that. Any, any other questions for um, in New York? From looking at this? Oh, hey, Lisa, let me, this is, and again, let me add one more thing about New York. It's Absolutely. also confusing um, in New York because the four commercial payers in CPCI saw savings. Uh, two saw savings to the plan itself, but it didn't get over the minimum savings threshold, but the plan net saved money on commercial and or Medicare Advantage. And then two of the plans um, saw savings such that they returned that to the practice in, in terms of shared savings or, um, uh, you know, some, some kind of bonus payment. So we had a really bifurcated experience between commercial, sometimes Medicare Advantage lives on the one hand, and the fee-for-service lives. Okay, so that kind of disparity, I'm sure, was really hard to reconcile for, especially for the practices, obviously. What do you attribute that to? I really wish I knew. I, I mean, really, like, I, we really spent some time plugging on this. Um, I, I mean, the short answer is we don't know. I think there's a real chance that the management of the specialty activity is good enough for the Medicare fee-for-service lives. I think there's a real thing there. Um, and then 
I believe there's something in this Medicare fee for service comparison group in our region. You know, if if half of your lives are that you're being compared to are in ACOs, is the benchmark moving on you in such a way that it's hard for you to keep up as a primary care physician on your own? Um, I think it might be both things working together, but I, I am not confident about that statement. This Thanks. is Tiffany from Ohio. Um, we have the same perspectives and experience as Susan has mentioned as well. Um, we've looked uh, long and hard at the comparison groups. Uh, we really do have about the had about the same amount percentage wise of Medicare lives in the comparison groups that were in other ACOs mm -hmm. and other um, payment model advanced payment models. And so we really do feel that that impacted uh, the um, the way that our performance was represented uh, in the Mathematica reports for shared savings. Um, when we look at some of the other data, Ohio um, did very well in their uh, their uh, ambulatory care sensitive condition admission observed to expected ratios, decreasing those admissions. Um, you would expect those admissions to have a significant impact on expenditures. Um, we also did uh, have the, the greatest number of practices improved in the project based on some of the um, analysis that was done by TMF. Um, so we had the least number of practices that declined uh, in their expenditures and had the greatest number that improved in their expenditures across all seven regions, although that was not reflective in the shared savings analysis. Um, when I hear Oklahoma and Arkansas speak, I really feel that um, we shared a lot of those same experiences. We had a very strong um, multi-stakeholder um, collaborative. We were um, you know, very strong in our transparency of data, uh, cost utilization, and clinical quality measure data within that multi-stakeholder forum. We uh, had data aggregation efforts well underway, and, um, and we were about 75% uh, system owned practices. So, just wanted to share that I feel that we very closely align with uh, Susan, you know, with what Susan found within her region as well. We had commercial payers that did realize shared or realized savings uh, within the project. Uh, it just was not reflective in the Medicare data. Tiffany, thank you very much for, for sharing that. Any questions for Tiffany from Ohio? Okay, great. Um, so, Summer, uh, Basel, I think you're on the line with the um, Old Health um, Authority and the um, Medicaid agency in the state of Oregon has been a strong supporter of CPC+. Did you want to speak to that uh, briefly in terms of what you observed in Oregon? Um, sure. And I, um, I wasn't here. Um, I wasn't with OHA for, um, for CPCI, um, but um, I've... Um, learned from you know from others that were here and we did um we did experience you know the clinics did get shared savings um for medicare in in 2015 um i um and i some lessons learned that i that really helped contribute to that as well as um as our success in um you know across the the measures of hospital admissions and um and readmissions um, was the the um, as others have said the the power of, of all payers promoting changes for their um, for their entire population um, um, and you know and the, the work of, of payers working together we did not we had a, um, a multi payer collaborative we did not have a and then we had the um, the technical assistance that was provided both nationally and locally to the practices. Um, we did not have um, a multi-stakeholder collaborative, um, which I think, uh, which we do have um, um, more, you know, now with CPC Plus, and I, I think that's um, a, a great benefit. Um, the, but the peer-to-peer the -peer learning across the, the practices, um, both, at, you know, especially the in-person, 
um, was was really valuable. We had um, um, you know practice coaches on the ground um, in clinics, um, which um, you know I, for CPG Plus is um, is really not not as possible this this time around because of the the fewer resources for technical assistance, but. Um, which is really unfortunate, and we're trying to figure out um, across the CPC Plus payers, um, as well as uh, you know all payers in Oregon, how to support practices um, with technical assistance because um, that that was um, really valuable to um, to the practices um, um, as well as as the payers, um, which was uh, yeah. Um, and then the CPC Plus, or the CPC Connect online tool was the, um, the second most utilized resource by the practices. Um, and, um, and so that, that was um, a great uh, I think enabler of, of, of our success. Um, despite the, um, you know, the change fatigue that was, that, it, you know, it's, we're all um, addressing, you know, dealing with the cross practices, um, the, because I think because of the, the technical assistance um, that was that was provided in the, the learning activities and that practice facilitation um, that practices remained engaged through throughout the the initiative um, but there you know there was the appetite for transformation um, did vary across across practices um, and I think that those are kind of the you know the highlights from from Oregon of our um, kind of contributing to our successes. I think that just to share the, the challenges as well that, um, you know, that, that HIT um, and kind of getting unstuck um, from um, the, the challenges that, that limited some transformation there was um, something that was, that was frustrating to the clinics. Um, the reporting, some of the reporting was, was frustrating, although towards the end um, the practices were, uh, learning how to interpret the reports and um, found them found them useful. We did not have data aggregation across the the payers, um, and so I recognize that that was both a challenge for the practices, but also a challenge for the payers to to see um, see the impact. Uh, um, I think you know they all are. We're happy to see that the shared savings through through Medicare, um, but there was not that same. Um, uh, impact um, for individual payers, um, which I think, um, which did we lost a big payer in CP, for CPC Plus, and I think that was um, part of that, the, um, why that happened. Um, and the the risk stratification um, for care management, there was a great increase across um, all practices in their ability to do that um, over the course of um, of CPCI. Um, but it was a, it was a great challenge to some practices, and it really dominated um, some of you know attention. So I think it, it contributed their ability to do it for, um, um, at the end contributed to the the success of and the um, shared state. But it was it was a significant challenge. Uh, Diana, if you have anything that you would would add, um, I know you weren't you weren't there for CBCI as well, but um, sort of your your perspective from now facilitating the CPC Plus payers. No, um, no, I think uh, Summer did a, a fine job, and I'm in a car, so I apologize that it's loud. But I, I mean, the only thing I'd say is to her last point about not having data aggregation and some of the challenges that that presented is. That's something we're working hard on right now, plus, and we'll sort of see how far we get and um, and whether that makes you know helps us understand better the the results and how things are going. So that's all I'd add. And thanks, Summer, for for that summary. Great, thank you very much to both of you. Any any questions for uh, for Summer or Diana around the Oregon experience? I just want to point out you um, that Oregon did lose uh, one uh, big payer in the transition from CPCI to CPC Plus, but gained a whole host of other payers in uh, both uh, going into CPC Plus and then even in round two added a number of payers. So there's now a, a number. I think it's. Well, yeah, I actually think that that's, Lisa, I'm glad you pointed that out because I think that's important. I think we have 
um, because we have 16 CCOs, we have like 18 payers at the table. So it's a really different dynamic than having three to five payers at the table. And that adds sort of a richness and also a complexity. For which you are very well suited, I would like to point out. Um, so thank, <laughs> thank yes, you. Yes, we, we are very fortunate to have, to have Diana and, uh, and QCOR um, to help facilitate the, the, the many payers. Absolutely, and, and also the support of the state um, that some of you and your colleagues provide, so that's great. Um, hi, you, hi, Lisa. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is Suzanne from Rhode Island. I just wanted to ask uh, if maybe at some point in time there could be a conference call on an area that we're trying to work on in um, Rhode Island. And I think it might be related to, you know, cost of care as well. Uh, we're doing some work with our SIM dollars around social determinants of health. And one of the things that's being explored is how social determination social determinant of health information is collected and then to what extent it might get shared with the HIE. And so I just thought it would be really helpful at some point in time to know if there's other people that are doing things around social determinant of health collection that also then gets shared in the HIE. Um, because I know the, the work about the um, CPC Plus is also going to be around social determinants of health. Great. That's a great suggestion. And actually, our next uh, webinar is going to be uh, talking about it's a, a fairly more specific kind of uh, cut on that, but uh, around the, um, specifically looking at the high need, high cost um, uh, population sector, which I think would fit into that. Um, that great. Thank yeah, you so much. Well, your specific example about how that works with a, an aggregated data system is important. That'd be great. Yeah, terrific. That's a great question. So we only have about five minutes left. I want to make sure that um, everyone on the phone has had a chance to either um, describe uh, what they'd like to about their own observations or, or uh, questions, especially from our round two uh, regions that are just sort of uh, diving into this for the first time. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, it's Bob Browner. Is okay if I... Had a question or sort of a comment so far. Yes. Um, you know, we're really excited that Nebraska is finally selected. Unfortunately, I think we're limited by two major issues, and one is that uh, it's not multi-pair; it's two-pair because we only got Blue Cross to participate, so we have no state or United Healthcare involvement, unfortunately, which limits any overall state support right now. And the problem we're also running into is that the CPC Plus program doesn't integrate well with the ACOs, and the way CMS is deciding things, they're actually literally excluding the ACO management from being involved in CPC plus. So our, I'm chief medical officer ACL right now. We have six clinics in CPC plus, but they won't send any of the information to us at the ACO level. And they literally, if I have a question, I have to have one of our clinics ask the question for me. Um, and, and I think it's very unfortunate because I think we're the main support structure for those clinics, but because CPC plus is excluding involvement of the MSSP ACOs and how it's rolled out and sharing information, it's been kind of a problem. So, so I guess if you have any influence, it would be nice if they would open that up so that the CPC plus clinics that are part of an ACO can work with the ACO infrastructure. I, I, uh, from your mouth to God's ears, as they say. Um, so we, uh, we <laughs> influence, but I will certainly be happy to pass along that observation. Um, my understanding, just for clarification, is that the exclusion really was specific to the next gen accountable care organizations. Um, there were um, Medicare shared savings programs cool. that fit um, into uh, participation yeah. for CPC plus. Well, well, you can participate in both. The problem is just no information is getting shared. So no our clinics that's... turn to us to ask them for help and we can't help them because CPC plus won't include us in any of the webinars or meetings. And when I try to answer their question, I say, well, you need to ask this because I can't ask it for you. Um, it'd be much more efficient if, our, if the CPC plus program, people were responsible for Nebraska would involve us on the ACO level because we're the ones sort of providing that, that organized support because we don't have any state support that's organized. Okay, um, I will be happy to pass that on um, to our colleagues in Baltimore. Thanks. Sure. Any other comments or questions from our colleagues around, around the country? It's actually very cool. You have all, all the time zones represented here. Okay, well with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating. Um, this has been recorded, so uh, we will be uh, putting this up on our website uh, if you don't want to listen to some of this again or uh, pass it on to your colleagues in other places. Um, be happy to have that be an opportunity. Um, everybody have a good day, stay warm, and uh, thanks very much. Talk to you in a month. Thanks.
Thank you, Lisa. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Lisa.